Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 9th of November. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by a special guest, former ANZ Bank Director John Dalson. Welcome, John. Thank you, Robbie. This week's episode of the CEC Report, I will be doing an interview with John on how can we make the banking system work for everyone. Before we begin, though, John, the, um, I just want to make a few points. The the CEC has put out a couple of press releases this week on some of the official responses to the Royal Commission, which have come to light, which are atrocious, such as the, the government, which we'll talk about in a minute, the government has preemptively reappointed the chairman of APRA instead of waiting for the Royal Commission's report. And the bank's submissions to the Royal Commission have come out and they're basically saying, don't you dare change us or else there'll be consequences to the way the financial system works. So it's a sort of a, a, a none too subtle threat. So in the press releases, we have encouraged you, as usual, get involved. Don't just take this line down. You know the, the, the importance of banking reform in Australia. Get involved. Contact your member of parliament over this and ask them what are they going to do about it. Because if, if everyday members of parliament can feel the pressure from the public, they're going, their own constituents, that, that strengthens their arm as they go into the political process to the, to the leaders of their parties and say, come on, are we going to let them get away with it or are we going to get real reform here? They need to know you're, you've, you're behind them. So make sure you make those calls, send those emails and keep them on their toes on this matter. All right, that said, let's get into it. So my special guest today is John Dalson. John was a director of the ANZ Bank for 20 years, which is how uh, I've come to know him and, and um, uh, why we've, uh, we're having him uh, on this show today. He's also a long-standing uh, corporate lawyer before that. I think you were director of Woolworths as well. Chairman as of Woolworths. Chairman of Woolworths. Uh, Herald and Weekly Times. Chairman of Herald and Weekly Times. Chairman of Herald and Weekly Times. So John, this is an interesting combination, John and I, because John represents a, a different perspective on the economy and the, and the banking system and finance than the CEC do. Um, you could say we're outsiders and he's been an insider, but... The financial system has deteriorated so badly that someone like John and someone like the CEC have found common ground with many other people around Australia and the world, especially since the 2008 crisis, to say, look, there's a problem here that must be addressed, and we'd like to talk about that. Um, well, can I should say this, Robbie? Um, ideology is irrelevant to what should happen in the banking sector. So it doesn't matter whether you're from the right, the left, or in the middle where I am. Um, it's absolutely irrelevant. Um, here, here. I agree profusely. And this is, this is what we're finding, and as we'll talk about in a minute, on the question of policies like bank separation. There's broad support for it. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons we can actually get, I'm confident that we can actually get some change. So John, let's just start off with a bit about yourself first. You've, you've from a, um, uh, an established banking, uh, a business background, um, your, your, your yes, family my, company. Yes, my family uh, have been in East Gippsland since uh, 1862. They came to Australia as uh, gold miners from Denmark. And a few years after that, they established a business which has now been running for uh, 144 years. And I think it's probably uh, one of the only, or well, say five surviving run family businesses that's, that's, that's stayed in the same, broadly the same kind of activity. Um, and uh, the interesting part about that is that the family have been through um, depressions, um, big, great, great times, um, and uh, um, it's interesting that we've been able to survive the uh, the ups and downs of the economy. Well, that, that's that's a testament to the abilities that your family has. You through your through your business activities, though, you you found yourself as a you wound up as a director of the ANZ. From from the through the eighty throughout the eighties and nineties and into the two thousands. Yes, because what happened was rather than going back into the family business, I decided to do law, basically to get an education. I wasn't allowed to do commerce because my family said we can teach you all you want to know about commerce. Right. So they let me do law because they didn't think I'd get beyond the first year, second year, third year, fourth year, um, <laughs> and and I, I managed to get through. And then I was invited to go to a law firm. The family had used once and uh, 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 they allowed me to do that grudgingly. And then uh, what happened is that uh, I, I fundamentally uh, fell in love with the law. Um, so, um, and a few years after that, uh, I did an MBA and I'm probably the first practicing lawyer in Australia to do that. So I've had uh, an unusual um, but very interesting background. No, you have. And so 
what I find interesting is with your business experience and your law and banking experience, you've come to conclusions now about the banking system. So let's get into that. I want to, my first question for you is, um, you represent, I would say, an older generation of banker. How would you compare the banking system today, 14 years after you stopped being an executive director, with how the system worked in your time, especially in light of how, what's been exposed by the Royal Commission? Well, I think what's uh, fundamentally happened um, is that banking has got very uh, aggressive um, and uh, there's been uh, a competition between the banks as to who's got the highest uh, return on equity. Um, and uh, that competition has fed its way through the organisation where they've put, as, as, as Commissioner Hayne has said, um, profit uh, before people. And uh, from the Royal Commission, that, that is absolutely self-evident. It is something that people have believed in for, for a long time and all that Hayne has done has proved the, um, uh, the fears that a lot of people had. Um, but they lacked the uh, ability to do anything about it. And of course, Hayne, is, uh, who's an outstanding, um, is an outstanding judge and individual, he's got to the bottom of it. I think people would be surprised. No one, would, no one would have thought that banks never pursued profit, but the fact that you, as, a, as someone who was a director for so long, can make that comment about banking today really does underscore the aggressiveness you talked about. Um, what, was, what, what would you characterise as more the outlook of banks in your time? Well, they weren't fiercely competing to see who had the highest uh, return on equity. Um, and there was a greater inclination to, uh, to serve the client. Um, and there was a slightly higher uh, social obligation because what you have to remember is that the banks um, uh, have licences yeah. as, as deposit, in, in deposit-taking institutions. And that's a privilege. And historically, there's been a sort of an implicit understanding that that brings with it um, certain obligations. But now, that's been completely disregarded. It, it, it's profit above all else. And that's what the, uh, the issue really is today. To what extent should the banks um, reflect social obligation? Now, I think the, uh, uh, the government has a lot of levers because they can place conditions on the licences yep. and, and require the banks to do certain things. Um, it's, it's not difficult and uh, maybe this is going to, with the next thrust of the Royal Commission to be what are the solutions, maybe stuff like this is going to be, going to be debated. Well, but it is, quite, it is quite easily fixed. Well, let's get into some of that in a minute. Before we do that, I, I want to highlight, there's, there's, there's one particular question I have that that I think your, your observation is important because of your business background. Because in recent, when I, when I started reading some of your papers, as a businessman, your criticism of the banks um, that you've made, in those criticisms you've highlighted some of APRA's policies, the bank regulator, especially this risk weighting question, where they were able to incentivise mortgage lending above lending to business. And we can put a chart up on the board on the screen and you'll see this, this dichotomy from the banks where they put all their lending into, into Oh yes, I'm, I'm, I'm well aware of that. If you look at the chart, you'll see that the mix of uh, business lending to mortgage lending has deteriorated enormously. And how um, damaging and that, do you think that's been? I think it's been extremely damaging and that's, um, and APRA are partly responsible for that. APRA claims to have uh, saved the system in the global financial crisis. I think APRA in fact has caused a great deal of damage. Um, and uh, I, I'm hoping that this might be, um, uh, that APRA might be more exposed than it has been. Uh, I've written extensively about this, but uh, I don't seem to be getting any traction on the subject. Well, look, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get into this question of the problems and solutions. Welcome back to this special episode of the CEC Report, where I'm interviewing former ANZ Bank Director John Dalson. John, in 2014, the Abbott government set up the Financial System Inquiry, and um, it was headed by David Murray, the former Chief Executive of the Commonwealth Bank. That inquiry and the report it wrote did not mention any of the problems that have now been exposed by the Royal Commission. At the time, you were one of the only people 
aside from like we we, we criticised it as well, but you criticised it forcefully. I remember you, you you got into the news for saying its report was written by bankers on behalf of bankers for bankers. So in light of what the Royal Commission has revealed, would you say you've been vindicated? Um, y yes, I have. Um, these uh, occasional uh, commissions that we have are very, very important for the Australian economy. And it's very sad that they appointed a banker as chairman to undertake that because what was needed was a fresh look, uh, not someone that was trying to uh, justify the status quo as, as Dave Murray fundamentally did. Yep. And his, his report was basically a laundry list of uh, operational issues that should be addressed. And some of those uh, recommendations he made were very good. But he didn't look at the structure of banking. He didn't look um, at the declining reputation of, of the banks. And that was a first class opportunity to do it. Now, Murray having failed to do that means that we've lost, what is it, five, five years. Yep. We've lost five or six years um, until Hain has come along um, who has uh, cut through. Uh, who's a not lot a of, banker. Who is not a banker, but a very intelligent guy, uh, a very experienced judge who has cut through a lot of nonsense and got to the, got to the fundamental issues, which is uh, incredibly refreshing. Yeah, well... He is a fearless, uh, he is a fearless uh, individual um, and he will do nothing, leave no stone unturned until he gets to the bottom of the issue. Well, viewers, viewers would be interested to hear you say that. And just to make the point, you actually know Kenneth Hayne, don't you? Well, what? when you're a corporate lawyer, yeah. you tend to uh, come across all the QCs, um, either in cases that they may have done for you or, um, or, or against you. Um, and uh, no, I don't know him well, um, but I know enough uh, about him um, to say that he is an outstanding individual and one should um, look and think very carefully about the recommendations he's making. He's got a big team behind him to help him with detail. Uh, and I, my view is he's been very clever. Uh, when he first started, I, my, my uh, uh, anxiety was, how can the, the devil can you deal with all the thousands of complaints yeah. that are going to get? And his tactic of asking the banks to self-confess was brilliant. Now, um on these matters I mentioned at the top of the show where the banks have said in their submissions, don't touch us. The government has basically sent the message by reappointing Wayne Byers that he has our confidence. You, how do you think Hayne will respond to those types of subtle messages or non too subtle messages to him? I don't think it would worry him at all. He will be uh, hell bent on getting to the bottom of things, whether it, it makes the government uncomfortable or not. I think the interesting thing about this Byers appointment is the power of Treasury. Treasury um, and the Treasurer. Um, Treasury is a very, very powerful agency, as indeed is the Treasurer in terms of uh, a government. Yep. Um, and uh, they're, very, um, uh, they're very quiet. Um, they stay, they work, they work in the corridors, not out there in the public domain, and their influence is phenomenal. And what Treasurer will be concerned about in all this is they will not want to uh, dilute their power and influence. No. And um, and, whatever, and, and any recommendations they come up with, you have to uh, reinterpret and say, what is Treasury willing to do? No Treasurer, even in a corporation, likes to uh, uh, let go of the finances. It's, it's understandable they'd behave like that. Um, but it, it, but it, it is interesting seeing how it plays out. I think the appointment um, of bars to, or the reappointment, I should say, um, is extraordinary. Yeah, and uh, not to not to wait, I find um, I, I find interesting, and in, in, in my view, um, that's the uh, uh, treasury uh, who are very powerful in influencing government, uh, protecting the status quo. And the other question about Byers himself is his connections to the Bank for International Settlements, and what influence they may have had over this, because that avenue to us into Australia is a way that weakens democratic accountability over our well, system. Well, the, the, the difficulty, he was very successful internationally and played a big role in developing uh, international banking standards. But the difficulty about that is that every country is quite different. It's got very, very different needs. Now, the problem with Byers is that he wants to import to Australia the international standards, some of which are relevant and some of which are, are not. And um, my view is that the, our banking regulations 
uh, could, could have been and could be more tailored to what is in the interests of this country. Well, let's talk about now the things that the financial system inquiry should have touched on and that you've been highlighting. You're a fierce critic of APRA from a, from a unique position of an ex-banker. I love this quote. You're called APRA the monster that protects the banks. What do you mean by that? Well, um, APRA is a very interesting animal. There's very little discussion about it. And when I started researching its background, one of the one of the things that comes out very heavily is that the APRA is basically funded by the banks and there's a huge number of bankers in APRA. So in APRA there's a lack of a highly intelligent individual people that um, have got uh, the background and now to challenge the bank model and to challenge the banks. And it really is uh, quite incestuous. In fact, one bank chairman uh, publicly thanked APRA for the fantastic job they did. When that comment was made, I, I was a bit stunned. And of course, uh, after the research I've done, I discovered why. Um, because APRA makes the banks very competitive. And the fascinating thing is that the Productivity Commission is very concerned about APRA's role and takes the view that a lot of APRA's regulation is in fact anti-competitive. Yeah. Um, it is, it is, it is um, not, sorry, I made, uh, sorry, it is not fostering enough competition in the banks. It's yeah. having the reverse effect. And I hope uh, that, we, that we get into that issue. Um, and whether we do, um, I'm not too sure if that will be in, within Haynes' mandate because where this leads you to is the structure of banking in Australia. Yes. And the difficulty is uh, we are a small country and it is inevitable in the various business segments um, that monopolies will emerge because a lot of our companies are world-class operators and it's inevitable that they will gradually build up um, a concentration in the market that really is unacceptable. And that's the problem with the banks. Yeah, it, this it, is it, oligopoly. It's an oligopoly, but yeah. it's worse than an oligopoly because what, what, what in effect is happening is um, the banks are all the same. You could take the badge, you could take, get, take the Westpac badge and put it on A and Z, and no, no one would notice the difference. Banking is changing rapidly, and we need, um, we need innovation, and we need it fast. And the only way that's happening at the moment, or the main way it's happening at the moment, is all these small fintechs. Yeah. Although there is evidence that some of the banks, like Westpac uh, and NAB, I'm sorry, probably all of them, are trying to cope with this space. But whether their activity I is enough to, to open up uh, banking or restructuring banking um, is questionable. Well, let's take another break and we'll come back. We'll continue this question and look at the, the question of complexity too in the banking system. Welcome back to the CEC Report where I'm talking to ANZ, former ANZ Bank Director John Dalson. John, you said just before the break that you could take the badge of Westpac and stick them on all the other banks because they're so similar. The submissions that the banks have just made to the Royal Commission struck me the same way. They were virtually identical. They all said this, don't change our vertical integration. Now the vertical integration is where the banks have had all these other businesses and they've pressured their staff to refer depositors and customers into all these other businesses. You had an interview with Channel 9 on this once it started emerging out of the Royal Commission. What's your view of that change in banking and the effect well, it's had? This is one of the sad things uh, about uh, the crisis in banking. Uh, it's something that Hain hasn't been mandated to deal with and I don't believe he will. But the, you've got to feel for the staff in the banks. Banks are essentially top-down run and basically the front line are told uh, what to do. And they have little chance uh, of um, contributing to any decision making. They're pawns and in my view they're treated very badly. Now on top of this, or, or, or I should say not badly financially, uh, but as, as people, they're not yeah. respected. Um, but the reality is that a lot of those people at the coalface, they know what's going wrong in banking. You recall with the CBA scandal, um, the Austrac scandal, that the people at the coalface complained, but no one listened to them. Now, I think that's appalling in any corporation where you've got people at the coalface know something is going wrong, but the senior management won't listen to them. So in all this debate, 
spare thought for these, these people in the banks. Yep. Remember that a high proportion of them are going to be made redundant as well. They could, tomorrow they could lose their jobs. So, they, so the banks are making decisions who's going to stay and who's going to go. Clearly you don't help your cause um, if, you're, if you're pushing for change. So um, I, really, I, I really wish the media uh, would focus on the plight of the lower management and, and frontline employees of banks. Well, let's talk about... I wonder where the unions are. Good question. Financial sector union, pay attention. Let's talk about one solution, uh, John, that can address a lot of this, which we agree on, which is, the, which is structural separation, separating the commercial um, deposit-taking side of banks from other businesses, especially investment banking. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that? And interestingly, also to elaborate, why do you think it's in the interest of shareholders? Because that's a unique argument yeah. you make. Well, um, my view is that banks are very complex organisations and uh, with technology to become even more complex. Yeah. And banks um, try to serve uh, uh, many markets, some uh, offshore as well as in Australia, with products and services that are really quite different. And it's an, enormous manage, it's an enormous management task to be able to handle that. And I think a lot of the problems is caused not only by structure, but by complexity. And, and what's happening at the moment is that some of the banks, particularly ANZ, are waking up to this and said, look, the best we can do is to simplify our banks because if we simplify them, they're easier to manage we can give better customer service, and we probably can have better relationship with our employees. So you ask the next question is, well then, how do you do that? Does this mean you've got to break the banks up, or does this mean that you leave it to the banks to um, opt in or opt out of certain uh, activities? Well, uh, both are possible, but there is one aspect of banking uh, that worries me, um, and that is that the, the government have in effect guaranteed deposits. Yep. Now, with a guarantee of deposits, those deposits are available for all banking activities. Yes. Now, I think the reality is that those guarantees should only be available to, um, to the retail side of banks. So I think one way of, uh, of dealing with this is to separate out the retail banks, the retail activities of a bank, and that, the, and that only the deposits to the retail bank will be guaranteed. Now, this has got, this has got other consequences. It means that the retail bank can have a different uh, uh, concept on leverage than the, shall we say, the commercial bank. It could have a different view about, um, about uh, uh, derivatives. And what follows from doing that is that it'll make it easier for the bank's executive team to create shareholder value. Because when you streamline an organisation like this, you, you will become more efficient and more productive. So I think, irrespective of what your view is about Glass-Steagall, whether you like it or whether you don't, I think there's a very powerful argument that you can mount, that a shareholder can mount, that this makes a hell of a lot of sense. Now, yep. interestingly, this demerging process John, is happening in other sectors. No, that, that is interesting. Sorry, I have to, for the sake of time, I have to wrap this up. Um, we'll, we'll continue this discussion, though, which will be on YouTube. But I want to thank you for, for this segment of the CEC report. Thanks for coming. What you've heard is a banker recommending the Glass-Steagall principle himself. So make sure you tell your members of parliament that. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the CEC report. Welcome back to our YouTube viewers, where I just want to continue the discussion we're having with John Dalson on what's needed to fix up the banks. So before we had to end that, John, you were talking about how the, there is demerger happening in not just the banks, but in other sectors as well, which is an example of why banks need that principle. Is that what you're saying? So that because complexity has to be um, addressed here. Yeah, it, it definitely has to be. Um, and it's a shame that there uh, isn't more debate about this in the community because um, if it was, you'd get all the smart investment bankers around town looking at it and being quite excited about what the opportunities were. But to enable demerging to take place, there are some difficulties. There are capital gains tax and stamp duty issues. And I'm not unsure 
uh, that, that, that some banks, and I think one, looked seriously at, at, at a, at a demerging in terms of it had a belief that it would create great shareholder value. But what stopped them was the, the capital gains tax and stamp duty uh, inhibitions. Now, one thing that a government could do is that it could, it could say, for the next uh, um, two years or whatever, uh, we'll have a period where, if you want to demerge, uh, we'll pass legislation that frees you of capital gains tax and stamp duty issues. Now, it's not easy because stamp duty is a state, a state, a state yeah. uh, in, in, um, cost. But I think the arguments for doing it would be so powerful that I, I can't see why the, the states uh, wouldn't uh, cooperate uh, in the process. Well, our legislation that the CEC drafted, which Bob Catter introduced into Parliament, give, would give the banks two years to demerge. And um, I think it would be, you, would, you would say that for it to work properly, the government would probably have to look at those things and go, well, if we're, if we're going to require the banks to demerge, we should remove these obstacles that are in the way as well That's right. to make it happen. Um, before, before, uh, 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 well, before we get into the next thing I wanted to raise, though, just to follow up on this, uh, it strikes me, see what, I'll see what you think about it, but it strikes me when you say this, um, uh, I tend to think, well, you might be reflecting your view as an older generation of banker because based on these four submissions that the banks have made to the Royal Commission in response to the, the inquiry, they are not expressing any desire to go down that path at no. all. No, they're not. So how do you, <laughs> your work is cut out for you if you think it might be voluntary, whereas would you, would you concede because um, that you know, legislation is probably going to well, be required I, here? Well, I'd, I'd prefer to be done voluntarily and that uh, reflects my uh, ideology, which might uh, differ from yours. Um, but having said that, I think the the government can make it very attractive for the banks to do it. And don't forget, there's a lot of analysts out there that would be analysing these situations. And if they came to the conclusion that it was smart for a bank to demerge and create shareholder value, there would be a lot of, a lot of pressure. So uh, I'd rather uh, exhaust that area before, um, uh, before um, uh, making it compulsory. The other aspect is you've got to remember that, <coughs> that the government issues these banking licences and uh, there's no reason why they couldn't insert into these banking licences uh, certain um, conditions that might in effect push them to demerge. But I don't think you should underestimate the power of the investment market. I've seen recently a couple of situations where the investment market is actually telling sectors uh, they should they should demerge. Um, and, uh, and the companies are taking notice of it. So I think there's a, uh, there is a, an avenue here where a lot of these problems uh, uh, could be solved. But what we need is we need uh, more conversation and debate. And um, it's, it's a shame that the Hain Commission has not been mandated yep. to deal with structure. That is the big missing piece in all this. The structure of banking is causing a lot of the problems, including greed, and that's that's the clear pr that's the clear point that we agree on. As a, as a banker, you understand that. As as people that campaign for bank reform, we understand that structure is the key, and the banks are trying to deny that at the moment. Let's talk about. Well, I think it's a good reason. You see, um, put yourself in the, in the situation of a bank CEO. You um, you have an enormous amount of power. You're probably the bank four bank chief executives are probably the most powerful. Uh, chief executives in the country, yeah. the decisions they make have an enormous uh, uh, impact. Now, it's only natural for them to say, "Oh, I want to, I, I want to keep that power. I don't want to delete my dilute my power. I can cope with all the so-called problems that you're articulating. We can yeah. we can deal with those." Well, uh, that's to be proven. No, that's right, and their track record would would testify otherwise. I want to raise something now because I, I, I'd, I'd like the viewers to hear your experience on this, and it, I think it's one of the it's one of the elements that is not given enough attention, and it's this question of derivatives. And I would argue, John, it's probably the of of all the reasons that you look at why the banks should voluntarily see the benefit in in um, separating. 
This derivatives question, because well, it's not very well understood, no, I, I, I the, agree with might that. Might be the I, I, think two, I think there are two good reasons for it. The one I've already, uh, the one I've already uh, uh, mentioned, um, that is the government guarantee of deposits, restricting that to yep. uh, the retail bank, which is a very powerful, um, because what that means uh, is that the interest rates on the retail side of the business will be lower than, than the the commercial bank. But the other one is um, is derivatives and. Uh, uh, I'm ashamed to say that um, I've had a problem with derivatives. As chairman of the ANZ Audit Committee for some years, I found it extremely difficult to understand derivatives. And I was fortunate in that I had uh, a couple of uh, great uh, ANZ executives that uh, did their best to help me uh, understand the dynamics of derivatives. And what I felt was that after looking at them for some time, I understood them for a short minute, but the following day I would have lost that understanding. And the conclusion that I came to was that really to understand derivatives, uh, you have to be a mathematician. And some of the uh, maths that applied to them is yeah. quite complex. And I've got to say, in all honesty, that uh, I did not understand them. But what I do understand is that derivatives have increased dramatically. And I think the issue with derivatives is there's good derivatives and there are bad derivatives. What a bank is all about is matching its assets and its liabilities. And where it can't do that, the profile of deposits, the profile of its lending, it is quite legitimate for a bank to undertake derivatives to try and do that matching, provided the company they're doing the derivatives with uh, is, um, uh, uh, can stand by those derivatives in the event of a call. But there's another class of derivatives which I think are no more, no less than gambling um, and basically undertaken by traders uh, to make a margin. And my view about that is that uh, you may as well uh, go to the casino. And the difficulty I have about, about the gambling type derivative um, is that they're even more complex than yep. standard derivatives matching assets, assets and liabilities. Standard hedging derivatives. That's right, standing hedging, which, which I think are very desirable and, and, and banks should be encouraged to do that, provided the whole of the derivatives is worth powder and shot. But I think the first step in, in understanding the derivatives market is to segment the market into derivatives that make sense and derivatives that are in essence gambling where the only beneficiary are the traders who make a margin on it. Now, until you get that information, until you get the segmentation of derivatives, um, it's very hard to work out what to do about them. In the meantime, the alarm is that the, the amount of derivatives is absolutely astronomical. Yep. And you would have to ask yourself is that if the derivatives had to be honoured, what would happen? And uh, my gut feel is that there's no way they could be honoured. So we have a problem there, and, and, and I think they should be unwound. But I can't tell you how they should be unwound. But what I would want to do is that if you want to separate the banks by separating retail from commercial, then one thing I would strongly recommend is that the only derivatives the retail bank can engage in are genuine hedging, genuine matching the assets and liabilities, and not to get into the gambling. Now, what that does is it isolates the problem in the commercial bank. And let's face it, a commercial bank has a very different risk profile. Uh, and if it wants to go and engage in that, that's fine, as long as its shareholders know exactly what is happening. And I don't believe shareholders yeah. and the market understands derivatives. And I, I don't. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a very important perspective you've provided there. I can tell you now, if we did a separation of the banks, the, the, the proportion of the gambling derivatives that are left will be by far the greatest of them all. The, 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 the derivatives that stay with the retail banks will be very small. Um, unfortunately, those, those derivatives that are, that are the gambling derivatives have actually been effectively collateralised by those deposits, right? So that alone will, will force the investment banking side of the banks that are left to, to unwind these things or deal with the consequences, whatever That's they right. may be. That's right. right. But as a and I just want viewers to understand that if you, as someone with a 20-year experience in banks, no, no, can no, have no. That I must correct you. That was 14 years ago. 
um, and that's a long time ago. So oh, exactly. I think you've got to uh, you've got to be careful about that statement. Well, very important. It, it's got in those fourteen years since you've been in the bank, the 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 scale of derivatives in Australia's banks has just gone off the charts. No, I'm referring to uh, my uh, uh, understanding. Ah, oh, well, that's true. <laughs> well, I think um, John, I appreciate you coming. Right, your your perspective is very important. Um, it's important for the Australian public to know that there is a, a growing consensus on this question of the need for structural reform, right? Which um, your perspective as a as a former banker is very important because ultimately it's coming. The motivation is the same. It's not ideological. It's how do you make the banking system work? That's right, and I'm not the only one that has this point of view. I gather uh, Don Argus has made uh, a similar comment, and of course he's a a very seasoned, experienced banker, and yep. uh, his perspective on something like this would be quite valuable. But the other thing is that if you get people inside the banking industry to talk about this and debate it, um, that would be fantastic in, in coming to a resolution. But I think the overriding thing about this is APRA has a huge role to play in understanding the derivatives and segmenting the derivatives and enabling the public to understand exactly what's happening. I agree. We have to make sure that the pressure is applied politically to make that happen. That's our view. All right, John, thanks very much for joining us. And thanks to the viewers. Take this to heart. Um, we'll put up some links to where people might be able to find some of the material John's written, especially an important article that he wrote for the IPA review. We'll put that on YouTube below. Um, definitely have a read of that. And share this video with people, and especially your member of parliament and your banker. Go, go see your local bank and say, what's this video? We need to get this debate going and growing. So, John, thanks very much. All my material is available for reading by anyone. It's all gone into the uh, public arena, some with a little bit of exposure and some taken absolutely no notice of. So uh, that's the problem with being, when you're at my age, you become, you're a feather duster. Uh, let's, okay, Operation take, Bring John Out of Retirement. That's what, make sure you watch this video and share it. He's not a feather duster. All right, thank you very much.